This is Joanne Culbertson Jeffries visiting with Jack Iverson on the morning of March 29th, 2023. Jack, thank you for agreeing to be recorded for the oral history collection of the Washakie Museum and Cultural Center in Moreland, Wyoming. We have two goals. First, that our class of 1960 tells what life was like for the kids and teenagers in Moreland from about 1941 to 1960. The second is that we share how growing up in Whirlin impacted our adult lives. Jack, would you please give us your full name and tell us where you currently are while making this video? Yes, uh, I, this is Jack. Uh, full name is John Riley Iverson. And I'm in Lake Havasu City. Uh, this is our winter home. Were you um, known by any other name or nickname while you were in high school or when during your school days? During my school days, uh, I started out as John Riley Brown, uh, nicknamed Jack because I have a twin sister, Judy, and my mother thought that Jack and Judy sounded better than John and Judy. So my nickname was Jack. And that's how I was known through, throughout school was Jack Iverson. If you weren't born in Worland, how old were you when your family arrived and what brought them to Worland? Just tell okay. us a little bit about your family. Okay, so, and, uh, my family, uh, my mother married James Roland Brown and uh, he, he did so in 1941. <clears throat> and we grew up for two and a half years in Ten Sleep, Wyoming. And the house still stands not too far from Dirty Sally's in Tensley, kind of on the back street behind Dirty Sally's. And my dad worked for the general store and Leo Rhodes uh, general store on Main Street in, in Tensley. And I found out later that he lost that job because he there were some indiscretions that he, well, some things he did wrong while he was uh, working for Leo and Leo had to let him go. So at that point, uh, my mother, and dad, well, my mother decided we needed to move because we didn't have a job in Ten Sleep any longer. And she had three children at that point. I have a twin sister and an older brother, Terry, twin sister, Judy, and uh, we had to move somewhere. So we moved to my grandmother's house out on flat, uh, South Flat Road at the Fairview Dairy. And we lived with my grandma uh, for most of my really young years. And that was a really, really positive experience for me. I don't remember Ten Sleep that much, except I remember I met later in uh, my life. I met a the gal who was the postmistress in Ten Sleep, and she said, "I remember you and your twin sister coming in and talking to me every day because you could. Uh, your parents would allow you to walk around the the town a little bit, and uh, that's when we were between three and four years old." <clears throat> Yeah, and I don't know how we got out of, of the house at that age, but we did. So anyhow, we moved uh, out to grandma's house out on South Flat, and that her name was Daisy Bell Snyder, Daisy B. Snyder. And her her uh, husband was John Riley Snyder, and that, so you can tell where I got my name. I got it from, from my granddad Snyder, and everybody loved the, uh, John Riley Snyder because he, in his early days, was the only person to have milk cows. And he was the only person who had milk for the uh, town of Worland. And he had a pasteurizer, he had a, a, a bottle washer, and those were glass bottles back then. And uh, we would milk our 87 Guernsey, Jersey, and, and brown Swiss cows, which were high in cream, but very low in volume. But we would milk those every morning and every night. And we were expected to be down at the milk barn every morning and every night as young kids. And that's when I was three and four years old, four and five years old at the most. And down there, and we'd have to go down every morning. Uh, and this is before we were in school and have to help with milking, which meant for us feeding the cows and, and then helping clean the gutters after the, the cows were out of the barn, which meant cleaning the poop out of the the, the gutter and, and, and getting all of that pushed out the end of the barn. And then the hired man would, would come in with a, with a machine and pick it up the, the manure and put it over in a manure pile. And then they, after that ripened and seasoned, they would put it on the fields. 
uh, to help grow the crops. <clears throat> but uh, that was a, a very, very important part of my life is learning responsibility <clears throat> and just getting up and getting down there. And I remember one day when I didn't feel good and I wasn't going to go down at the barn and I didn't go down at the barn. And suddenly there was a tap, tap, tap on my window. And it was my uncle, Uncle Clifford Snyder saying, Jack, you must be down at the, the, the barn. You get down here right now. It was a sign of laziness and, and uh, not wanting to do my share of the work. So I went down and after I vomited in the middle of the, the, uh, the barn, he said, now you can go back and go to bed. Now I understand why you're not down here. But you, there was always that response, you know, always a feeling, I think, that that, uh, that was, and were his kids treated the same way? And he had four children. He had uh, Bill was the oldest, Bill Snyder. And then Joanne, who married Harold Coe, was the second person. And then uh, Buddy Snyder and Lloyd Snyder. And Lloyd uh, is the only survivor of that family right now. And he lives in Powell, Wyoming. And I do stay in touch with him from time to time. But that was really, really an important part of growing up was being out on the dairy farm. And, one of the neat things was that a guy, the hired man out there was, <clears throat> his name was uh, Ralph Cornwell. <clears throat> and Ralph Cornwell was, uh, was a tremendous hired man. He headed up the, the milking every morning and every night. And then he was out in the field cultivating or planting sugar beets and doing those things that, 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 uh, that he was assigned to do. But Ralph had a tendency to get drunk on Saturday night. And he was allowed to go into town on Saturday. And and uh, Uncle Clifford, who was very high up in the, in the Methodist church, I mean, way up high. I mean, he was on the church board and, and worked with Reverend Golf uh, and making the Worland uh, Methodist church the finest church and, and the only church really is what we were taught of. The only church to go to and, and uh, the only true church because of, of the, uh, the minister and, and how they saw themselves did not care for Mormons, did not care for Catholics, did not care for Presbyterians, did not care for anything. Baptists, Baptists tend to dunk people. We, we uh, uh, baptized with, with the, the water on the hand. And, and uh, there was just lots of things that we learned when we were growing up that told us that the Methodist church was the place to be. So uh, anyhow, uh, Uncle Clifford uh, would go in and get the Ralph Cornwell out of the jail uh, on, on uh, later that night and he, he would tell you know go home and sleep because we got to get out and do milking in the morning and that was that he, that's how good Ralph Cornwell was that, that Clifford Snyder would actually allow him to stay out there and work even though he tended to drink too much once in a while not every Saturday night but at least once a month I think uh, that's my memory that uh, Uncle Clifford would have to go in and, and get him but Daisy Bell Snyder was maybe five foot four maybe five foot three, uh, when mother would go to work, uh, she was in charge. And I can remember uh, when we would get in trouble, uh, she would cut off a branch off of the willow tree just off there at the back porch. And she'd say, stand there and you will, you'll get your whipping. And if you run from me and run for her and I have to chase you, you get it twice as bad. So the, you know, we, we took our, we dropped our drawers and got whacked across the butt with a willow brunch when we, when we did things wrong. And of course, I didn't, I thought we were perfect, but she didn't think we were, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but she was, she was a very, very important part of my life. And she moved out of her bedroom into a, what they called the south bedroom of that house. And my mother lived there. And then we lived in a little bedroom uh, and they put a bathroom finally in the house before that, we had to go out to the milk house where they had a shower and they had a bathroom. But they finally got a bathroom put in Grandma's house and uh, and with a with a bath with a bathtub, not a shower. Showers were, came later. But uh, that was that was a big event for us to be able to live with her and live in security, while our our what I would call my sperm donor father. Uh, was allegedly off at war, uh, wanting the the story goes, and and it was verified by my mother. Uh, he uh, took off and to be a merchant in the merchant marines down in New Orleans area, and uh, 
I don't remember him very much because I didn't get to see very much of him. It was right after, right before, as he got fired in Pensleep, that's when he decided he needed to take off and go to the war, uh, to the war effort. And he, uh, uh, I remember him coming back once with a really neat uniform and it was a Navy uniform. And I remember him sitting in my grandma's house with Terry on his lap. And there were pictures taken that I've seen of him uh, sitting there. But uh, we found out later he didn't, and I did a complete study on him in my genealogy to try and find him to see if I had any half brothers or half sisters because my mother divorced him after uh, she received a letter back by general, general delivery uh, that had, was not deliverable in New Orleans. It was sent back, somehow it got back in our mailbox at the, at the post office. And in there was a letter to his girlfriend. And it was that letter then that my mother took to Judge Harkins and said, I want total custody of these children and I want a divorce immediately. And Judge, Judge Harkins read the letter and he said, uh, Josephine, uh, uh, I totally understand. We do, do have to search for him to see if he's interested in, in, any, in any custody. And uh, while he was gone allegedly to the war, which he was not in, uh, and by the way, he was an only child, uh, and his his family was the, the uh, uh, Jim Brown. His name was James Roland Brown, and he his mother uh, she was he was an only child, and her husband worked on the railroad between uh, Worland and I don't know where uh, Thermopolis, and I don't know if it was farther up the line or not. But uh, uh, there was some good that came out of that that I'll share later, but <clears throat> uh, some very wonderful things that happened because of her and her feeling more responsibility for us as grandchildren than he did as a father. Um, but uh, she, uh, James Roland Brown uh, um, was great. We, mom was granted a divorce from him. And so we had... Uh, Mom had total uh, custody of us, uh, thanks to uh, Judge Harkins. But it really built a riff between my mother and her brother, Clifford Snyder, because he did not believe in divorce. He didn't, and he really liked Jim Brown because Jim worked out at the farm a little bit before he took off. And Clifford always thought that Jim was just a, a very good person and mom she, of course, he didn't know, my, my uncle did not know anything about the letter. Those were, those were closet type communications that you didn't uh, share with your brother or your, your, well, I don't think that my mom shared it with her mother either. It was just something between her and I found it in the lockbox after my mother had passed away. I, I got a hold of my dad and I said, he said, I want you to come down and be with me in Worland at the bank when we open up the lockbox. And that's where we found that letter. Uh, that was returned back to by general delivery to uh, to my mom, uh, indicating that uh, that he had a, this girlfriend by the name and everything and what her address was and everything was on the envelope, but it didn't have any return address. But somehow, on, with the stamp on the envelope back then, they knew where it was from, and it came back to uh, to Worland and uh, everybody. Uh, and somebody made the connection and, and the letter got back to mom. So um, at, uh, at that point, uh, World War II uh, was, was impacting uh, the, the war and it impacted our family in a huge way this way. Um, John Iverson returned from the service after being the lead mechanic on a P-47 fighter that was a fighter squadron that was sent from the US to England and then from England to France and then to Belgium. And he followed that squadron because he was the lead mechanic for one of those airplanes. And he was a mechanic because that's kind of what he did. He worked on cars and they took those people during the service and just said, okay, here's the difference between a car and an airplane. If they even went to that extent, you're gonna repair and keep these, uh, these engines working on the P-47s. So that's what dad did in the service. And at the end of the service, he came home and the love of his life, uh, well, his five brothers, six brothers and one sister took him aside 
and said, John, you need to be aware that your girlfriend was not faithful to you. So dad immediately uh, after hearing that, um, well, it, he drove fuel truck in and out of Sydney, Montana uh, and Glendive and those, there's those places for about a year. And then he would see her every once in a while around town and he just couldn't handle it anymore in Sydney, Montana. So he had a car and he had one of those trailers that looks like a teardrop. It's just a little tiny trailer that you could sleep in and that's all. That's what he hooked at the end of his car uh, on the hitch and he headed headed towards Worland. And he's, and I said, why did, why did you come to Worland? And he said, probably because I ran out of gas. He said, it was time I had to get a job. And uh, he said, I looked around and, uh, and uh, I found, a, a, he said, I knew how to frame houses. I knew how to do some things, some, some simple carpentry. So he ran into a guy by the name of Martin Martinson in Worland. And he said, uh, I need a job. And he said, well, what can you do? And he said, give me an opportunity and I'll show you what I can do. I can build garages, certainly. And I, if you can build a garage, you can build a house. It's just a matter of adding more rooms and making sure everything is structurally sound. And uh, <clears throat> so one of his first jobs in, in uh, Worland uh, for Martin Martinson was building that garage for Bonnie or for Bailey's, for the Bailey family. She's not known as Bonnie Bailey any longer, but it was for the Bailey family. And it was that metal garage right by their house. And you remember the German family lived right across from the Bailey's and then they had the Lutheran church across mm -hmm. there again on Grace Avenue. Um, and uh, so he built that and then he got on with the Holly Sugar Company during campaign, but it was not a year round job. So he was continuing to work during the summer times for, for Martin Martinson. So Martin Martinson got it, got it was given a, a job of building a house from my mother, 515 OB Sioux, right next to the Chastains on one side. And um, uh, good looking Danish guy who uh, obviously showed some interest in her because he kept calling her up and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a workman, but he said, I've got some ideas how we could make your house look even neater. Instead of having square doorways, let's, let's round them. And to make the, uh, uh, to carry that theme through where you have the telephone will have a little inset into the wall with a little rounded uh, top to that inset. And uh, she uh, I thought it was neat and the more they talked, the more they started liking each other and, and John Iverson then proposed to her and could not get married in Worland because of the Methodist church. <clears throat> they just would not marry divorcees. So they got married by a minister in Basin. And when they left, uh, we were still out at, uh, the, the, my, my brother and sister and I were still out at my grandma's house when they got married because the house wasn't quite finished. And uh, they got married in Basin and went up to the Bighorn Cabin. And that was uh, up by Deerhaven. And it's the old Snyder Cabin. I don't know if you remember Sissy McKeon's cabin and Hampton's cabin and um, Iverson, it was a Snyder's cabin is what it was. It was, it was the, the Snyder cabin, but my mother had half interest in that cabin uh, as time passed. But anyhow, uh, uh, that's where they went for their honeymoon and his brother came down and visited uh, him. Uh, there were two brothers and thought it was finally neat that, that that uh, dad had gotten married. They didn't come to the wedding. That was a very private thing. Again, just between the minister, my mom and my dad, my dad to be uh, my stepfather. And uh, so when he came back to Worland, uh, he finished the house and we moved into town. And uh, that was my first moving into town experience. And and we lived intensely from uh, about 1942, because I was born on December 16th, 1941, nine days after Pearl Harbor was bombed. I always told my si twin sister, I said, the only reason you're alive is that, the, that my mother got excited uh, that, we, that, that a bomb had been dropped and World War II had begun. And so you were, and you were finally born and you're the, you're the younger of the two of us. So I'm the middle kid. And I think I act, kind of acted as a middle kid over the years. I was the peacemaker in the family. And wanted to always have have 
peace and tranquility in the family. And that was kind of, and I was the introvert in the family. Terry was the extrovert, no doubt about it. Judy was an extroverted uh, person. Uh, I was not. I was a, very much an introvert during during uh, my growing up years. And 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 I had to learn lessons in, in the hard way sometimes because I did not tell my parents what I was doing that would bring me home late uh, from my paper route. And I'll get to that in a minute. But getting back to World War II, it impacted our family because we gained a father. And uh, he was just an extraordinary, extraordinary, quiet man, very, very quiet. But when he talked, you wanted to listen because it was always worthwhile to hear what he was saying. Uh, and he, uh, but he worked hard. He never made more money than my mother. My mother always made more money than he did. And he, you know, it didn't bother him, but I could tell that he, he wanted to have extra jobs even after he went to work on the fa at the factory full time during the summertime too, he would want to have extra jobs um, in town just to make more money. I think it was a, a thing with him that he wanted to make more money than mom and it wasn't going to happen. My mother was the uh, office manager for PMA and it was production management uh, association and it was the first government program for farmers way back when, when they just started foam, uh, farm programs for sugar beet raisers, for cattle, uh, sheep, um, for wool, the wool program. They had different programs that supported farmers and ranchers. And uh, uh, then, then she became, and she was just an employee and her, I think her boss was Terrell Gibbons uh, during that time. And he, uh, he was the manager of the office. And then he became a field guy for, for uh, Holly Sugar out gathering acreage, trying to get farmers to, to put more of their land into sugar beet uh, acreage. And she then took over the office. And it was renamed Agricultural Stabilization Conservation Service Office, the ASCS office. And she was the first woman manager of an office a government office like that in the nation. And she worked hard at it, very hard at it. And I know that she and her brother didn't get along too well from time to time, but giving credit where credit was due, I think Clifford Snyder helped her get that job. Uh, you had to have an advocate somewhere as a woman in order to get jobs like that. You know, you were either a school teacher or a nurse or a homemaker, and that was kind of it back then for women. But she, um, she, got, she got into that job and she did very, very well. Um, uh, her boss was a Mormon guy out of Byron, I believe it was, a, 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 far, a farmer who was on the state farm board. And he uh, was, that was an advisory board for the ASCS program in Wyoming. And she, he was the head of that. And I, Jack, I can't remember his last name, but he was, uh, uh, he was the head of that. And I remember him coming to the house and, and visiting mom and dad. And, and uh, it always kind of bothered me because mom would come home and say, well, I came, came home from the meeting in Casper and had a good time and was out uh, dancing with Jack. And, you know, he was a good Mormon, knew how to dance really well. And, and I always thought, you know, this is not right. You know, I was pure Methodist through and through, and you just didn't touch a, a woman and serious heck didn't, uh, one who didn't want your your mother to be touched by anybody other than your dad. So that was that was kind of a, something I carried around with me. Um, so we ended up moving actually to uh, Warland. Uh, oh, we moved to town in 1949. It's what I was able to put together. Uh, and it lived at 515 Obisu and my dad said, okay, we, if we got this house payment to make, I'm going to finish up the basement and turn it into an apartment so we can rent it to help make the house payment. And that house or that uh, apartment was first rented to Harold Coe's parents. And that Harold Coe married Joanne Snyder. And Harold was uh, the head of the Buick garage, uh, his head salesman there, and I think even a manager at the Buick garage later in life, and was such a neat, neat guy. And his parents were fabulous people. Well, my brother and I lived in a basement in, the, in that same basement over in the corner. Um, and we had sliding doors that kind of separated us from the, from the apartment. 
and uh, we but we had to use the bathroom downstairs, their bathroom, and they knew that. And we had to be in and out of there by a certain time so that they could have the rest of the day uh, have access to that bathroom. Uh, so that's where Terry and I grew up. We had trundle beds. We had bunk beds initially, and then the big thing was trundle beds. So those are the beds we had back then. He always had the top one, and I always had the bottom one because so he could jump down on top of me and we could wrestle a little <laughs> bit. Now and then. Uh, but uh, uh, that was uh, that was how my dad was able to afford, and and I think he looked at his contribution to the family that he finished the basement the basement off. So that income from the the apartment was kind of looked at as dad's contribution to the to the income of the family, and made him feel really really positive about uh, uh, living with Josephine Iverson, the office manager for ASCS office. And that uh, their final office, they sat down on uh, Bighorn Avenue, kind of across from the courthouse. There was a series of offices there, and that's the last uh, location for the ASCS office that she worked in. Because we would stop there on the way home from school and, and, and check in whether we had to do that on the way home from school. That was part of the, the, the ritual or the routine for us. Getting to the school part of my life, uh, I. I have very, very positive remember, uh, members, memories of Mrs. Dyer. I don't know if any, either of you remember Mrs. Yes. Dyer. And that was, she was a first grade teacher, I believe, at, uh, at the, the only elementary school we had back then. And I can remember being bussed in <clears throat> to uh, school. And the kids out in the country did not go to get a kindergarten experience. Our first day in school was first grade. So. Uh, I think it was about the second or third day uh, and it was in the fall and it happened to be a cold day and it was rainy and the merry-go-round next to that school had over the years there was a a divot in the ground where you you know we were running you push the merry-go-round and it and there was kind of a ditch around the uh, the merry-go-round and that ditch had water in it but nobody worried about it you just jumped on the uh, you pushed it real quick from outside of that circle and 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 you you got on and we that would be our activity before we go into school when the bell rang and uh that morning i arrived at school and i got on the merry-go-round but uh i fell and i fell in that water <clears throat> now this is a kid that grew up with long johns on and that's with the flap door in the back and it was, uh, 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 we had one pair of uh, bib overalls. Everybody was poor back then, so that was no big thing. But we got a, a new pair of, of, of overalls uh, with the bibs <clears throat> uh, each fall, and that was to go to school and a new pair of shoes. Those are the things that we were given to, to go to school in the way of clothing. And if you had a, a shirt, and I always wore Terry's hand-me-downs for shirts, uh, but I had, that's what I had on and I didn't have another change of clothes that I could call it, that anybody could get a hold of my mother for. So Mrs. Dyer took me in and she said, Jack, she said, I'm going to have you sit on the heater. And these were heaters that were right next to the window, a kind of a bench type heater, a fan that would, uh, that would warm the room. And she said, I'll turn up the, the, the thermostat, turn up the heater. I think it was just a knob back then. To, to get the heat going so that you'll dry out by, by noontime maybe. And, and we'll, you can keep your clothes on because I know that would embarrass you. And she was just fabulous, just a fabulous, fabulous. And I remember her for taking care of me more than I do for anything, anything that she taught me. Mrs. Dyer was just an extraordinary person. She became a, really an unusual part of my life because when I was superintendent of schools in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we hosted the Wyoming Education Association Convention in Cheyenne. And as the host uh, superintendent, I was asked to come and give the opening address at that convention. And uh, they were honoring Mrs. Dyer as part of the legend, legendary uh, teachers of Worland High School. She was in her 90s at that point, had to be. This little old lady and I, I her face had remained unchanged to me, <clears throat> was out in the audience. And I began telling everyone about that story and began crying. 
why I was giving that, uh, that story <clears throat> at the opening of the Wyoming Education Association Convention and had her stand up and, and went down in the audience and hugged her again. Because it was people that took care of a, a very quiet, introverted, very self-conscious little boy with an older brother that was extroverted and was on stage all the time, and that was Terry. And Judy was very extroverted. <clears throat> but Mrs. Dyer was a very, very important part of my life. And that was what I remember most about uh, my elementary school. Uh, and as I proceeded in elementary school, I, my vision became more just, I couldn't, I had to sit up in the front row in order to see the blackboards. And I can remember in junior high, and I cannot remember the name of the teacher, but I remember, and again, and it was in the, there was the Watson building and the Emmett building. And it was the Emmett building we were in before we went to the new junior high school. <clears throat> and, uh, and it was Eastside Elementary, took over the elementary on the east side of town. But uh, I can remember the teacher saying, Jack, you're having to, to, to uh, get up so, you know, almost with your nose to the board to be able to read what I'm doing. There's something wrong with your eyesight. So they referred me for glasses. And at that point, I got my first pair of glasses and I could see the world. It was just a fabulous experience to be able to, to see and be able to learn and, and, and not have to ask for special accommodation to get up and move to the front of the room or go all the way to the board and practically put my nose on the, on the chalkboard in order to read it. So that was a big event. And that, uh, that teacher was, uh, was very, very important to me. Uh, in elementary or in junior high school, um, well, let's yeah, let's go back to elementary on the east side. A uh, Mrs. Foster and I don't I know she's not living, so she won't be upset with my telling this story. I didn't like her, and I you know I was very much an introvert, so I didn't really speak out. But she would punish kids around the room for different things that I didn't think they needed to be punished for. And she would punish them for out on the playground for different things. And I just didn't, didn't, didn't like her at all. And um, at the end of my, it would have been, let's see, now our junior high, uh, Joanne was, uh, was uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Is that correct? Yes, that's all right, correct. This would, have been in, this would have been in fifth grade out at uh, the new school. And Mrs. Foster is her name. And and uh, we had the type of desk that had a lid that you lifted mm -hmm. up and you put your, your books and stuff inside. And then you had an inkwell on one side. Yes. And uh, she, uh, towards the end of the year, came and she put her hands because I had the lid up. And sometimes we'd have the lid up so we could visit back and forth. Classmates could without her seeing us. Uh, I, I, and I might have been doing that. Who knows? Uh, probably was. But she came by and yelled at me. And I, she, she was a yelling, screaming teacher that was very upsetting. It was just a very, very tough year for me, just on an affect area and an affect way. I just did not like her. And when she did that, she had her hand on the metal part of the, uh, the, uh, the desk that, that, you know, they had a wooden top and the wooden top was up and I just tipped it. So it came down, down on top of her hand. Oh. She had to go, the last three days of school, she had a mitt that she wore on her hand. And she then wrote me up as a belligerent child who did not learn my prefixes or my suffixes, okay? <laughs> and so I had to go to summer school. And this is the biggest embarrassment of all. If you had to go to summer school, you were a dummy. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to summer school at the new junior high school. And I'll never forget the teacher there. She just said, Jack, I know you. I live close to you. It was Mrs. Young. And Mrs. Yes. Young said, Charlotte yeah, Young. Charlotte Young. And she said, Jack, as soon as you learn your prefixes and your suffixes, you're done with summer school. And in three days, I was done with summer school. She said, now you can go and, and uh, play in the community and have a wonderful summer. She said, you really did not need to be here, but you needed, for some reason, you were, that was a deficiency on your, in your program and you were recommended for summer school. 
And I was very, very embarrassed about that because Judy didn't have to go to summer school. Terry didn't have to go to summer school. None of the, none of the Snyder kids had to go to school. Nobody, none of my friends had to go to summer school. I had to go to summer school. And there were a couple of people that were in summer school that really did not, that struggled with, with learning and for whatever reason. And so that was, that was a, a big, she was a, a very, very important person in my, in my uh, junior high, as it turned out, the junior high, because she, she taught that, that sixth grade um, in junior high. So in junior high, the teacher that probably had the greatest impact for me was Hilda Meyer. And Hilda Meyer was eight foot tall and weighed 200 pounds, and she was a weightlifter, I swear. She was a big, <laughs> tall gal. And she, uh, she had an assignment every year for the class that we were to read Evangeline. And Evangeline was uh, one of the, one of the, well, one of the, what I called extra things that we had to do for Hildemeyer on top of the regular curriculum. <laughs> and anybody who could recite Evangeline, the first stanza, uh, the first stanza of Evangeline, then would uh, would recite them, and you got to you got to pick your time unless you were at the tail end of the school year, and then she would just call on you. And I certainly did not want to wait until the end of the uh, end of the uh, school year. But Evangeline by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was just a fabulous, fabulous. Uh, uh, poem, but it was it was one that was very difficult to read because he was a poet that uh, talked about things that I just didn't understand, but I memorized well enough to to be able to stand by my desk and and recite the first stanza of Evangeline. And uh, I remember Hilda Myers. If everybody, if anybody was not paying attention, she would take an eraser and throw it at him. I don't know if any of you were in her class, but she did yes. that in my class. Or she would, if she had a book handy, she'd throw the book. And she would seem to be a pretty good target with her throwing, because yeah. sometimes that was in the, the back of the, the classroom. But I, you know, she was never married. And I think I understand why, um, yeah. because I think she was a pretty tough gal. <laughs> you know? Two? Is that right, Kathy? Okay. She was married twice? Okay. I didn't I was not aware of that. I didn't know that she was not married when I had her. And then when when my she, father, my father had her her first. My father, Dick Haig, Grant's father, Tom Ujifusa, all those okay. people in that class, Gretchen mm -hmm. Bauer's dad had her when she was Miss Sunny. It was her first year of teaching. Okay. Wow. Wow. Well, this was kind of towards the end of her career because when she left and retired, she went out to the Wyoming Industrial Institute and taught out there. And I always thought, what a fitting person. You know, if anybody could keep those kids on task, um, it would be Hilda Myers. But I, I, I was scared of her, but I respected her. I, I really liked uh, her very, very direct and over communication usually of what we had to do. And she had to over communicate with some of us, uh, certainly. But she was, she was a, a really, really uh, fantastic person. And during this, junior high school and, ele or and elementary school, though that began really some of my uh, paper, having a paper route and have, being expected to, to deliver papers around town uh, and getting to know the town that way. Because living on Obisu wasn't the beginning and the end of, of, uh, of, of the town. The town was, had so many things in it and having a paper route and delivering the, the Denver Post uh, was one of them, and and it was uh, also I think the Casper paper, and it was the Glass family that uh, uh, Mr. Glass on Grace Avenue, who uh, who that's where we picked up our papers and would deliver them around town, and that was that was in my in my junior high, and my 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 dad always believed that idle hands would do the work of the devil, so you had to have a job 24/7. Uh, all year, and that, that was just part of it. After school, you delivered papers, and uh, that was, and, and that's so. That's what what Terry and I did, uh, and we did that until we were old enough to do some other things. Um, let me get to uh, Worland High School before I 
get into the after school jobs uh, anymore because there were a lot of after school jobs for this guy and for my brother as well. But uh, at Worland High School, I, 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 my folks would not let me play football because I had knee problems. I, my, my knees, I grew too fast and my knees, the little uh, tendon pocket right below the kneecap was weak and, and I could not play football until uh, high school. So everybody at Worland below wanted to be on the football team. Everybody wanted to be on the football team. And they were in the junior high program. So they knew a lot about football, you know, and, uh, you know, Dick Yingling and Jim Storr and, and Grant Ujifusa, all of those were fantastic. And, and Lorne Laird, I mean, those are, those were fantastic football players who played all during the junior high. So I, my folks finally said, okay, the doctor said you can play football. And now here you are your first year in high school. So I went in and I said, I want to play football. And that's when Joe Kinlan was the coach and, uh, and also a math teacher at, at Worland High School. And uh, uh, I was so excited about it. I went over to, to Joe Kinlan's house and he lived a couple of streets over from Obi Sioux and told him, I said, I'm, gonna, I'm a big kid. I, I weigh 180 pounds and I can really, I, I, I'm gonna be good on your football team. He said, we'll give you, you know, every opportunity to grow and see what you can do. Well, I got into the, the locker room and back then you had hip pads and the hip pad uh, is really came in three pieces, uh, one for each cheek and then one to protect your tailbone. And then I had a strap around the front and I didn't know how to put on hip pads. And it was Dick Yingling that took me aside and said, Jack, you got it on backwards. You don't protect what you got in front, you protect what you got back. And you wear your jock strap in front. And I said, what's a jock strap? And he showed me. So I went out and got a jock strap. And, and they showed, so they, they taught me how to, to get myself dressed up for football. And, uh, and that's when uh, they just said, Iverson, uh, we don't know what you can do, but we're going to start you out playing guard. And that was really Lorne Laird's position. And uh, then they said, no, we don't need you there. Lorne's doing a very good job. So we're going to have you offensive tackle and, and a defensive end. So that's kind of what I, the positions that I learned. And it, I had to learn it from scratch. And I had to have a lot of coaching after, after school. And, and Joe Kinlan did that. Uh, not a real successful year. And that's when they brought in Wimp Hugley. And Wimp Hugley married a gal from Thermopolis, and that's what interested him in the Bighorn Basin. And he liked the tradition of, uh, of Worland High School and winning all those state championships. And we wanted to get back to winning those again. And Lloyd Snyder's dad was on the school board, and he was instrumental in removing uh, Joe Kinlan as the head coach. He wanted his son's, uh, his son, uh, and that was Lloyd at that point, to, to have a better coach than that. So uh, that's when we ended up with Wimp Hugley and Wimp was just an outstanding teacher of basics. And he, you know, we learned basics every, every there was a basic uh, positioning and, and how to leave, you know, how to, uh, to execute a play. And, and he would run us through all of that day after day after day after day. And then at the end of the, just before the game, he said, these are, these are the 15 plays that we will run during the, during the game make sure you go home and have them memorized because those are the ones that you've got to know what your, your responsibilities are. And gee, we, we did pretty darn well uh, in, in high school. And that, you know, football was, was important to me uh, because I was big and Terry was not big enough to play football. Uh, Terry was very skinny and, and he was into debate and, and, and uh, into, into doing panel discussions and, and, school plays and stuff like that, debate. And back then they had a Reverend Cook who was the minister at the Episcopal Church who was the debate coach for Terry. And he was, and, and Dr. Or, uh, Reverend Cook was just an outstanding, outstanding debate coach. And because of that, the, the debate squads, when he was the coach, would win everything at, at the, the, uh, the uh, speech meet usually held at Northwest Community College in Powell. They would win there and then they'd get to go to the University of Wyoming for the finals in speech and debate. Uh, but uh, uh, that certainly football was important to me. Uh, being in on the debate squad was, and that's where I ran into to Grant. But Grant was, uh, as the quarterback, was just the smartest guy. That, and that's what Wayne Hughley said. I want the smartest guy 
in, in Worland High School to be the quarterback because this is a very, very complicated offense that we're running. It's not that he has to be big because he's never going to carry the ball, but he's got to pass it, short passes, and he's got to be able to hand it off to the right person. And we had what we called a triple option uh, backfield, and Grant would pass off the, you know, hand it off to various people. And on the defensive line, my job was to get to the opposing team's quarterback. And uh, I, you know, I had to learn a little bit of offense, but mostly defense. And I, they ran us in and out. I relieved Jim Storer when he would get tired or if, 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 if we wanted to run Dick Yingling as a, as a running back for one play, because he was so big and so athletic, I would take his spot on the offensive line. But, you know, football was important, but I was not really an outstanding player. I just loved being part of the group, though. I enjoyed traveling and getting outside of Orland and going to, to Riverton, going to Lander, going to Thermopolis. And Thermopolis was usually our last game of the season. Uh, and we got to play at Orland and, and, and Thermopolis. And we would go down early. You remember some of our, our Pepsters would go down to, to Thermopolis and burn a W in their football field. And they would come <laughs> up and do, burn a T in, the, in our football field when they, when they came to Orland. And those were some of the, the neat things that with the football program. With the debate, uh, I debate, uh, enjoyed speech and debate, and I enjoyed Nellie Mae Stuka. Nellie Mae was probably the most influential teacher, high school teacher on my life, and, and she really served two purposes in my life. She was a surrogate mother uh, for all intents and purposes. She, uh, I would come home from, from college. Uh, that's the first person I'd want to see is Nellie Mae. Say, when are you going to be out of school? I'll, I'll meet you. And, and part of the reason was that that's how I got to know classical music. Nellie May uh, had a group of about four of us come to her apartment, and that was in the McClellan house. And she rented out the top of the top apartment, the only apartment, I think. It might have been another apartment, but the, she had the upstairs. Okay. She had the upstairs. And she had a, a neat record player that had two speakers off to the side. And uh, we would listen to opera. That's where I first heard uh, the operas of Verdi and, and uh, uh, Aida, all of the, the great operas. She would have us sit down and read the, the, uh, the story before, we, and then we would listen to it. And it would be in a foreign language, obviously. And, and if that didn't matter, she said, enjoy the music and, and then read the story before. And so you know what's going on. And then you tell me what you think of it and why you, you felt the way you did about uh, uh, Aida or, or, or the other, the other great operas. <clears throat> and um, I learned to love opera because of that. And uh, later on, when I married this gal who was an opera singer, that became a, an important part of my, what I took to the, to the relationship with Connie because she was an, a true opera singer. She had a dramatic soprano that was unbelievably good. This little girl from Guernsey, Wyoming. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, with uh, Whirlin High School, and certainly being an actor in the plays, and Rick Williams always used to say, why are you getting all the, the, the parts in, in the play? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with just ne who Nellie May wanted to work with. And Rick was sometimes pretty overbearing. He was a very, he was a very extroverted individual, a very extroverted. In fact, he was so extroverted, uh, you know, his last couple years of life, he would call up and he'd say, Jack, I still need to know why I didn't get into the why I wasn't the lead in the, in the uh, play, uh, uh, You're in the Pink. You remember that uh, play we had? I played the part of uh, the, the boxer. And uh, Rick said, I could have been a boxer. I could have gotten in shape. I could have, could have played that part. And she knew it. And she knew I was the better actor. Well, I, I don't know why Nellie Mae did what she did, but, but I remember going into her English classroom during noon hour because I had to have a quiet place, a quiet place to study and to get my work done so that I could participate in extracurricular activity. So that's where I would go during noon hour. I go into her classroom during lunch hour, right after I grabbed my sack lunch and ate, would eat in there uh, and just sit in the back of the room while she was up grading papers or doing whatever she was necessary. And hardly ever talked to her, hardly ever talked to her. But she had just take, kind of taken an interest, I think, in, in uh, Jack Iverson and uh, uh, and I, so I had the lead in most of the school plays that while I was there, and I, 
I really liked it. And my sister Judy was an actress that was unbelievable. She was uh, a gal who took on the really tough roles. And, and there was an all girls play that we had. And Nellie Mae had me as the assistant director of that all girls play. And that was exciting. As she said, I need to teach you how to direct plays. And she said, I'll sit back and watch you do this. And that was in my senior year. And Judy was in that. And I think it was a story about seven women. And I can't remember the name of the, the play. But that was an exciting moment, too, as uh, directing that play. Um, Jack, we were blessed to have a, an older sibling as we were in high school. And your, your brother, Terry, was the same age as my sister. Um, we became aware of the different groups and the kids and things that were going on. And mm -hmm. I believe your brother, Terry, was involved in a group called the Apes and Tea Drinkers. Can you tell us about these groups and how that came about? Yeah, I've done a lot of thinking about that as a result of our communications. And we were in ninth or in eighth grade when all of this happened, uh, when Terry was very active in tea drinkers and Buddy Snyder was uh, and, and his athlete uh, guys were in the in the what they called the ape group. And it was uh, it was a term that was given to the athletes by the tea drinkers. They just thought that they were getting all of the attention and they the football team was fantastic. And Terry was too small to play, and Bill Howard didn't want to play, uh, could not, had no interest in it, nor did Morgan Hicks. And Morgan Hicks was really kind of an oddball type guy who did some pretty strange things in high school. But uh, anyhow, those three, uh, when, we, when we were in, ninth, in eighth grade, uh, they uh, had this kind of rivalry going on between the tea drinkers, and those were the people in speech and debate and and uh, school plays and, and really under Nellie Mae Stuka's uh, tutelage. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, Reverend Cook back then uh, as the debate coach and, and the athletes. And the athletes were defined by their sports coats and I mean, their athletic coats and sweaters and that sort of thing. And the tea drinkers didn't have anything like that. Uh, but they, uh, they decided that they were important to the school, just as important as the athletes were. And they, they set themselves up as the tea drinkers and they would go to Nellie Mae Stuka's place and they would sit down and have tea. And that's how the tea got into it, uh, was having tea with her. And she would make a big pot of tea and they would sit around and, and drink tea and listen to music. And that was before my, my, or my uh, group went up to her place to, to listen to the opera. And, um, so that's how they, the tea drinker names was, was dubbed on those people. And uh, they were, there was a rivalry going on even in school and in classes where uh, Terry uh, and, and his group and the, the athletes kind of butted heads from time to time. Uh, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't an athlete at Worland High School, back in Carl Selmer's day, when Carl Selmer was the winningest coach in in high school, the history of high school football in, in Wyoming, uh, you, were, you weren't too important. So there was a night, uh, I'll never forget this. It was really the day after that I remember. So I'm going to share it with you from my perspective. <clears throat> I uh, uh, came home from school and Terry was home. And I said, what are you doing home, Terry? And he said, I got suspended. And I said, why were you suspended? And, uh, and I found out on the front page of the paper, the, the Wyoming Daily News or Daily News or whatever, the newspaper, because they had a picture of this sign hanging down over the front door of the old high school. And that's where we went to school. Uh, and it said Ape Headquarters and down in the corner by Tea Drinker Sign Company. The piece of plywood, my memory is that it was about four by six or three by six and they had snuck up on the building and hoisted it up there uh, a day or two before, a night or two before they chose to be out at night. And, you know, being in high school, Terry could get out at night and choke at the others. And they got up on the building by getting up down by the ag department. Then you could jump on layers to get up to the, to the second story. Uh, and that was right over the main office <clears throat> for the, uh, for the principal and, and, Ralph Wellman and, and Charlie Roberts, I think were the uh, principal and assistant principal. And uh, 
So they got up on the building. They had already uh, several days had the sign up there and they, the event was scheduled by them when it was going to happen. And I think it was on a Friday before a football game, a home football game. And they dropped the sign over and they had just the amount of uh, rope that they could hang it on something that, that was attached to the building permanently. And they dropped it down over the front door. And uh, when, it, when Ralph Wellman came in, he just walked in underneath it. He didn't look up. Nobody hardly ever looked up. You, you were trying to go up the stairs into the front door. And uh, finally, Charlie, Charlie Roberts came in and he said, did you see what's up there? And so they went out, all out and looked and they said, Ape headquarters, it's gotta be an athlete. So they called in Buddy Snyder and they called in, uh, oh, who else? Uh, Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson. Uh, there were about 15 of them that they the called in one at a time, the Bashford twins, yes. <laughs> and they, they said, you guys are the, the, are, the, are the suspects. And until we find out who did it, we're calling off the football game tonight. And when the tea drinkers found out that was going to be the punishment, that the athletes would not be able to play the game, they just said, no, 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 we've got to fess up. So they went down to the office as a group. And that there were three or four of them that were involved in this, and they fessed up. They said, no, no, you couldn't have done it. And they said, we did it. How did you do it? Well, this is how we did it. And they kind of traced it all back and, uh, and determined that, yes, uh, yes, they, they could have done it. And they, and they admitted to doing it. And, and, uh, and uh, at that point, Terry was sent home, and the football team was able to play the game on Friday night. There was a respect between the two groups that they would not, they would not cause each other trouble. But there, there, was, there was also this, this belief on the part of the tea drinkers that they were an important part of the school. And they wanted people to, to know that. And, they, and after that event, a lot of people knew that they were around and who they were. And, uh, and not in real positive terms back then, but uh, pretty darn positive because they were, they were the outstanding uh, the members of the speech and debate team back then. Yeah. But it was not a it was not a, a violent relationship. It was a good relationship, and and uh, I think probably some of the farm kids remember the the uh, the FFA area and the ag area that was attached to that school as a wing, and uh, they were up there usually at night building trailers or doing something. And and Terry said I thought that they saw us because uh, he said we went up right right uh, right in the hallway that that one. Uh, uh, hallway that led to the gymnasium part. It was the low part of the roof. And he said, that's where we began our ascent with the, uh, with the sign about three days before they actually put it up. Uh, so anyhow, that was it. And, and they, because they fessed up, they were only had to be uh, suspended for that one day. <clears throat> so they, uh, uh, Terry didn't feel too bad about it. He didn't get into too many, uh, too much trouble for it. But my folks would not even allow him to go to, to Foodland to go to work, um, which he worked when he could as a, a carryout boy and as a cashier in his junior and senior year. So that's the tea drinker. What a wonderful memory, though. And um, I think that both of them became more respectful of the others because they the did. tea drinkers did confess and um, you're right, they just did not get the accolades like the athletes. Well, Many they times did. they still don't. Yeah, and, they, and the athletes were getting state competition uh, trophies and trophies, and the speech and debate team were getting their trophies, but they weren't put in the same trophy uh, cabinet with the athletes. And, you know, they fi it finally was by the time I got there, if you won speech and debate trophies, it got to put in the, the one and only uh, trophy case that we had at the school. So, yeah. Well, Jack, after we <clears throat> made it through high school and graduated, the Vietnam conflict, the war came to light. Did this have any effect on you or your family? It did on my, my dad's side, my adoptive dad's side. <clears throat> um, his, uh, my dad's brother, excuse me, <clears throat> my dad's brother, uh, um, Dan Iverson, uh, his, his son, uh, Scott, no, it would be Stephen, Stephen Iverson, was in Vietnam, and he was a patrol leader. 
and we we got to have a chance to visit with him. I visited with him several times about his tour in Vietnam because I I really did a lot of research on Vietnam. I wanted to know a lot about the the war that I was not a part of, and I was uh, I was not selected to go. We you, you had an educational deferment, and I don't know how people were selected to go back then, but I kind of got the feeling that the local draft board uh, kind of looked at last names and uh, who is doing what. And if you were, if you've gone to college, you didn't have to go. If you couldn't afford to college, yeah, you were, you were available. Um, Jim Heron, I know, went to, to Vietnam and, uh, and as, a, as an enlisted person. Um, and of course, the, I'm trying to think of the classmate who was one year ahead of us who, whose remains were found. Ray Krogman. Ray Krogman, yeah, and brought back from Vietnam, which spurred me again to, to do more and more research on Vietnam. But I spent a lot of time visiting with my son, uh, Stephen Iverson, and uh, he is still alive to this day. And we still talk from time to time about his time over there and, and what it was like. And he said probably the greatest concern he had as a patrol leader was that he, he had to pick out which of his patrol members were not high on marijuana. There were a lot of drugs available over there. And he said, I had to make sure that they, 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 could, they, they could pass a very simple test, cognitive test, and, and, do, and do so and, and convince me they were not on drugs. It was a very unpopular war. There was a lot of drugs being used over there in Vietnam. And he said, you just couldn't have somebody protecting your backside who was high on drugs uh -huh. or you just didn't know it. Because patrol leaders sometimes were, were murdered by people in the patrol because they didn't want to go into the, the areas of Vietnam that were being patrolled. So that was, that was my, my, you know, I thought my, my dad was not excited about anybody going to Vietnam. He just didn't feel that it was a war that should have been fought. And my dad was very quiet about it because he was a very quiet person. But he, he, right after high school, he said, tell me where you want to go to college. And I said, well, you are from Montana. So I want to go to Montana, University of Montana. And he said, fine. He said, you know, uh, and, and, and helping us, and I kind of skipped over this, with my maternal dad, uh, James Roland Brown, his mother, uh, when her husband died, he mar she married a very rich farmer out in California who grew black eyed peas and cotton in a very, very fertile area of California. And he was very wealthy. And when she died, uh, well, it was about a year before she died when she knew she was ill, she set up a trust fund for Jack and Judy and Terry to go to college. Okay. And uh, it was a small amount, it was uh, like five, $6,000. But that was that grew to about seven thousand dollars by the time we graduated from high school, so that gave us a nest egg to go to college. Otherwise, you know, there was a question whether or not we'd ever be able to go to college. So I told my dad, I said, uh, I, I, I want to go to college, and I said I've been saving all the money that I, I got from delivering papers, and I saved all the money that I got from working at Foodland. Um, and working at Foodland is another one of those stories that that uh, I'll cover here in a minute, but because uh, it was such an important part of my life. Um, but uh, I had saved my money and, uh, and dad said, okay. He said, we're gonna put you on a bus and you're gonna send you to the University of Montana, Missoula. I'd never been there before. I'd never been to Missoula, Montana in my life. I had no idea. The only place I'd been it really to my dad's place in Sydney, Montana, where most of his brothers, most of his siblings lived and his one sister. And they were all military people. One of them was a pilot. One of them was, was a tank driver who fought against Rommel in North Africa. Uh, another was the part of the Northern Command, a defense command in Alaska against the Japanese. Uh, they were just, in, in, in several of them were in the army. But uh, I went up to Montana all alone, very much alone. Again, an introvert, takes a little time to get to know people had a roommate that smoked, which bothered me a great deal. I couldn't, I couldn't study in a room with smoke. So I would go to the library all the time to get my work done. 
and I had it was burning up my my trust fund pretty fast. So after two quarters, I just said, no, 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 I can't I can't do this any longer. I'm going to quit college and, and transfer to the University of Wyoming. So my my dad said, my, I have a sister, Jack, that lives in Grand Coulee Dam, Washington, just uh, north of Spokane. I don't know if you've ever been to Grand Coulee Dam, but it's it's a beautiful, beautiful dam. And they they have a, uh, a motel there and they will help you get a job working for the government and you can make that money back and put it back into your trust fund by working up there if you're willing to do that. And he had coordinated with his sister and brother-in-law to do that. And uh, so I arrived in, in, in Seattle and they picked me up in Seattle and took me to their home, which was oh, probably 50, 60 miles away from there to Grand Coulee Dam. And they owned this, this motel right below the fall, the, the spillway of Grand Coulee Dam. And I don't know whether you've ever heard of it or not, but it's very famous for the spray, the, the light show that they have for the spillway, uh, the tremendous uh, spill. Well, you just call it the, the, the plume of, of uh, water that would come up from the spillway. They would put lights on it. And in the fall, it would be the orange, the yellows and the oranges. And then in the winter time, as you approach December, they would switch it to blue. And then in the springtime, it would come on to green for, the, for all of the spring. And they said, Jack, we like you. So we're going to put you in the, the, uh, the honeymoon suite, which was right above their apartment. And you, have, you can go out and sit on the, on the deck and watch that whenever you want to. And I took my record player with me so I could listen to some of that that beautiful opera music. <clears throat> and because I, I had those uh, vinyls back then to do that. And then I got a job uh, working on Lake Roosevelt. And that's the big lake that's backed up by Grand Coulee Dam, working for the government, uh, clearing out uh, debris that had broken fr away from boom chains because that was a big logging area. And they would have these trees, partial trees and stuff that would wash back up into the the uh, the different coves, and we would go in there. They'd have a, a caterpillar operator, and I had a chainsaw, and and you just worked all day until you ran out, you know, ran out of time, and then you'd hop back in your car or ride back from that area back to to uh, Cooley Dam, where, uh, where which is where I lived. And they were so gracious that they got my grandfather's car, a 1947 Chevrolet. They got it repaired so that I would have a work vehicle and be able to drive myself. For my recreation while I was there on the weekend, I would go to the bowling alley. I just needed to have some something to do that would be fun. And they wanted me to, they said, go to the bowling alley. You know, you can stay there as long as you want. And I got to be a pretty darn good bowler. Uh, never did join a league or anything because that required time after, after uh, you know, when I was out working because I would not get in until seven or eight o'clock at night each of the nights and had, but I had the weekends off. So that was, that was an important part of my life. And, and that probably if, if the truth be known, not coming back to, to Worland after being in that school. And that was, they were on the quarter system at the university of Montana, not being in school that last quarter, probably and going up there and my dad suggesting this in a very quiet manner, you know, you had the right rationale. You can replenish your, your trust fund so you can, when you, trans, you tra transfer to the University of Wyoming, that probably kept me out of Vietnam because I had a, I, I was being, I'm going to call it warehoused, out of sight, and they had never received a record that I, in Worland, the draft board had never received a, a record that I was not going to, still going to school at, at University of Montana at Missoula during that time. So I came back home um, to Worland and, uh, and went to work again and at, at, uh, at the grocery stores. And let me go back and just cover that a little bit for Worland High School. After school, I would go in, and work. And uh, during the summers, I would work for Alex Schlothauer, Alexander Schlothauer, uh, who was a Russian from Kraft, Russia, and his wonderful family. Sally was, uh, and Judy and David, just tremendous friends of mine. I befriended them through the store. But I was a, a sacker boy after school and during the summertime. And I would stock shelves and I was just bored. And 
Finally, Alex came up to me and said, would you like to learn how to be a meat cutter? And I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's the exciting part where you're behind a meat case and you cut cuts of meat for people and you make them happy and they get to help pick out the, 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 uh, the cut of meat that they're gonna buy for the day. And, and you know, you, you, you know, and back there in the uh, meat department was Lloyd Lafleur. And I don't know if you remember Lloyd Lafleur, a tremendous baseball player and he married Sally Schlotthauer. And, um, but Lloyd taught me how to cut up meat and so did Alex. And uh, they, uh, there, was a, there was a way to, to you know, this the seventh rib down on a half a beef. That's where you cut off, cut the quarters and you hang them up and they were in, the, in a big walk-in cooler and the triangle packing would drop off uh, uh, however many front quarters and hind quarters that we had ordered, that Alex had ordered and they would be brought in on a rail and they would be back there. So you lifted them off the rail, brought them in, knocked them, or put them on a meat cutting block and began breaking them down further with the help of a, a 220 ba a bandsaw. And, and that was your main, and you did a lot of that in the back room where people wouldn't see all of the messy part of it. <clears throat> but Lloyd would say, you stay back there and break down stuff until you're good enough to be out front. And you don't know how to talk to customers anyhow, Jack. So at one time uh, after I had been working back there for, as a meat cutter for over a year, Lloyd looked at me and he said, it's time to break you in to, to go out front. And he said, uh, you, you have to kind of talk to your customers and kind of, you know, you're promoting the best cut of the day and, and uh, what you've got a lot of and what's on sale. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I remember he was listening uh, to me and I think he was in the back room and they had these flapping doors that between the, the meat market and the, the back room where we broke down the beef. And uh, Mrs., uh, oh gosh, they ran a plumbing outfit. Uh, Denny? Pardon? Was it Danny Plumbing? No, it was a different one, I think. I can't remember the name of it. Hmm. But Mrs., but she came in uh, to, uh, and I think she might have been a school teacher on top of it too. But she came in and she said, uh, do you have any, have, have any round steaks? And I said, absolutely. And I took the round steak out and I showed it, you know, I had to pull it out, put it on your, put it on your hand, of course, putting the tissue paper down first. And then you held it up like this. And I said, Mrs., I think it was Mrs. Young. I don't know. But I said, Mrs. Young, this is a perfect, perfect round steak. In fact, you can roll it all the way home. <laughs> and I heard this giggle, giggle, giggle. And she was giggling and she said, that's good enough for me. She said, I'd like to have one and a half of those steaks. <laughs> but Bless your heart. At, that, at that point, Lloyd Lafleur was just laughing in the back room. And he, you know, he said, you're going to do fine, Jack. He said, uh, you, you did relate it to the cut of meat and you were telling her what the, the, what the uh, cut of the day was and it was on sale and it's what she wanted. And you gave her a really good cut because there was a difference between the good, the good uh, round steaks and the ones that had too much gristle and fat in them. And, and it took me a while to figure all of that out. But they taught me how to be a meat cutter and, and, then, and believe it or not, being a meat cutter helped me get through college. It not only helped me in Warland, but uh, I became a meat cutter at the University of Wyoming at Green's Grocery in, at the University of Wyoming at, at, in Laramie, about five, six blocks from the campus. And, and I would <clears throat> drive my little car down to Green's Grocery and, and go to work every afternoon as a meat cutter and work, work the weekends. And so it helped me get through college. Uh, again, trying to get through college without any debt. That was the goal. And that trust fund helped out a great deal. That was, it saved us. And Grandma Stenslin, and that's and it's just coming to me now, her, na her married name to this, this guy, uh, Al Stenslin, who was my adoptive grandfather on my dad's side, the brown side. <clears throat> uh, he, uh, he called himself that. He never really adopted anybody. But uh, he fell in love with my grandma. And... Uh, Al Stenslin, when she died, he, he's the one who delivered the, uh, the checks for each of the trust funds. And he came in with a roaster from my mother that, that it was the favorite roaster that, that his wife, my grandmother on the brown side had. 
and he wanted us to have that. And then he found out other things that we needed. And we would every once in a while have letters from him saying, I want to give you another thousand dollars to help you out with your college. Yeah, I want to give you, you know, stuff for your, your family so you can have uh, more food. As we went through high school, we didn't have a lot of beef. We went up and shot deer. We shot many, many deer, two or three deer a year. And then uh, uh, if we needed meat beyond that, because we didn't have a good deer season, we would get a front quarter from the locker plant. Remember the locker plant? Not too far from where we live. The ice plant. Okay. And uh, we would get a front quarter. And from that front quarter, you'd get hamburger, you would get chuck roasts, and you would get ribs, rib steaks. And you would get round bone roasts. And, and that was it. I know all the cuts because <laughs> that was kind of something I had to, had to know about. And uh, dad would say, we're going to get beef. And then he said, let's have one meal of beef every week. And the rest of the rest of the time, we'll eat the venison. And we, it was important uh, that we got the venison. And when dad came back from the war, he had a German Mauser rifle that he had gotten off of a German uh, soldier that was killed. And he brought it home. And they were allowed to bring those guns home from the war. And that was the only gun that, and it kicked like hell. He said, my gosh, he said, and he didn't have a pad uh, to protect his mm. shoulder when he shot that, that long ranged rifle. Uh, and I don't know what caliber it was, probably around a 30 out six in, in caliber. But uh, he would, and I remember him uh, up in 10 sleep in a canyon area. He would look over and he said, you see that deer way down there? I said, barely. And he said, well, and he didn't have a scope. I mean, it, didn't have, it was just an open sight. And he was able to kill it in two shots. And we were the happiest people in the world as we ran down with... Uh, carrying the knives and stuff so we could gut it uh, out in the field. And, uh, and then we would drag it. And sometimes we had to cut it in half and drag a half at a time with the, with the hide on to split the hide down the back and drag it out. But we knew we had meat for winter. And uh, it was, it was uh, my brother who went hunting with the Evans. Uh, I can't remember his name, but one of the Evans uh, families and and they would take Terry up to go hunting separately. And they would always make sure that he had a deer to come home, even though he didn't shoot it. But they, they knew that we needed to have meat in the freezer. Yeah, Slippery Evans was just a little ahead of us. Was it, they called him Slippery? Was that it? That could be it. Yeah. 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 Lived yeah. on 15th. Lived on 15th. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Robin. <clears throat> Robin. So, any, so anyhow, you know, pardon Kathy said it Robin, was Robin. Robin Evans on was on fifteenth. Robin Evans. Okay. They, what was the what were the Evanses that lived up uh, almost on the edge of town, up by the new high school? That's um, where I thought that White House. That was I thought where Slippery lived. I don't remember. That, that was. I think that's who it was, and that's who it was that Terry went hunting with, and that's a place that I would go after I'd go to Eastridge Elementary to have a place to go before I got my paper out. <clears throat> and just, but anyhow, that, that, you know, that was important to us is uh, having enough food and, 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 uh, and my parents' life. And when we moved to town, we, we lived out at grandma's house and moved to town, um, oh, probably in 1949 is what I'm guessing, or close to that is when we moved to town. And lived in that house. And like I said, we lived in the basement <clears throat> and, uh, and it did not have to. And we lived in town and that built kind of a, a barrier between the Iversons and the Snyders because we, we left the farm and uh, we were able to survive without being on the farm. But uh, Clifford Snyder was a very generous person. And, we, and if anybody was sh short money and needed milk, he would give them milk. Uh, he would barter for milk strawberries. Uh, Kathleen Albert's parents grew strawberry, had strawberry pa patch out by their log house out on south, south of Orland. And, and her dad would come in with strawberries and that's, that's what he would pay, that's how he would pay for milk uh, during strawberry season. And Clifford Snyder and his dad were very, very generous people. 
uh, and on the dairy. And it was dairy, dairy gold that came in finally, not too far from the Washti Hotel, back on a side street there. That was the uh, meadow gold. And, and that's when uh, the Snyder family began. Uh, no more delivery, no more uh, bottle washing. We just pasteurized the milk uh, and pulled the cream off and sold the cream and the, the milk to meadow gold. And that's, that's, that was a transition point for, for our whole family and, and how Clifford and, and Joanne and, and that whole Clifford family uh, worked after I left. Uh, and, the farm. and Jack, after our high school, you've explained some of the adventures you've been on. What drew you to education? To I would have to say, I would have to say people like Irene White, who when she taught English, you would knew that you were completing uh, the freshman year in college English because she was such an extraordinary teacher. Uh, Nellie Mae Stuka certainly was a key and she encouraged me to go to college. Um, I think uh, the Snyder family, uh, Lloyd going to college was part of it. I did not want to be left out as a person who couldn't afford to go to college. Buddy going to college, uh, that was important. Joanne went to a business college is about as far as she went. Bill stayed home and, and took care of the dairy. He inherited all of the dairy farm. Uh, so Bill was carried on with the, the business and, and the sugar meat business and all of that after, after his dad died, he then inherited that. But that was, you know, it was, it was just kind of expected to, to, uh, to go on to college and education. It had to do with the teachers that I had, Joanne. They were extraordinary teachers. I remember Mac McDonald uh, standing up in front and he'd say, Mr. Iverson, you will come to the board and you will, you will solve this problem. And you yeah. knew that that related directly back to the assignment you had the night before. And he would know if you did your assignments by that. He didn't want to do a lot of grading of papers. He would have you stand and perform. And that was, a, that was an important part of, of uh, also leaving an imprint. I thought Joe Kinlan was an excellent teacher as well. I liked Joe Kinlan a lot. He lived about two blocks from me. And I really liked Joe Kinlan a lot. The only bad thing about him and the Snyder family was he was Catholic. But he married a Mormon, and he became oh, Mormon later. And he 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 then joined the Mormon Church, uh, the Church of his wife's uh, faith. And uh, I just thought the world of Joe Kennan. I just thought he was a very very special person. But the the teachers the teachers are what guided me into a field where I just thought let's let's try teaching. And and at the University of Montana, I did not have a clue what I wanted to go into. The University of Wyoming, I <clears throat> I. Uh, Really, it wasn't teaching. I, I took political science and international relations, majored in international relations and poli sci, and really, really enjoyed history, enjoyed studying international affairs. And the Vietnam War certainly was, was part of that, uh, World War II, and, and you know, had some tremendous, tremendous professors. Looking yes. back at everything that you've talked about and all of your experiences, what do you wish that we had known back then that we now know? How would that have changed things? You know, I, th I think the, the thing that, that I wish that I would have had a greater appreciation for were the Japanese that were in our community. Uh, we had so many of them in our class, you know, and in fact, we were blessed with, with Tommy, Tommy um, oh gosh, he was later at- Fujikawa. Fujikawa, uh, Tom Fujikawa and his older brother, Bruce, um, Nikki, or Mickey Tanaka, um, Grant certainly, but Grant didn't come from Hartville and I didn't know about that. Uh, Grant, Grant clarified all of that many years later for me. Um, but we had those that came in from Heart Mountain and they were, they were truck farmers. And while I was at Foodland, they would come in with their vegetables and they were just barely making it hand to mouth by these little truck farms. They'd be selling vegetables because they were tenant farmers back then and didn't have their own ground, but they did. They were given a little bit of ground to grow vegetables. And so Alex Slaughter would say, you know, we got the Tanakas coming in today or we have the Fujikawas coming in today and they're delivering, they're delivering vegetables, get them cleaned up and, and, 
and get them weighed so we can pay them. And we always paid them cash on the barrel head uh, when, they, when they brought that in. But I didn't know a lot about their background until later uh, when I studied World War II. And I, I wanted to go back and, and, and talk to Tommy. I, I uh, have talked to Tommy. I did talk to Tommy a lot when he was, and he was in Cheyenne for a while too. As I recall, and, and down in Colorado, I think is where he ended up. And then having having uh, our class reunion, being able to sit at the table with Tommy and with Grant, and and sit down and, and discuss some of those things openly and how they felt. I wanted to know how they felt in this 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 environment of Worland, Wyoming, because it was a very very conservative environment, but we were accepting. I think in many ways. But I didn't know about uh, um, Hattie Peoples and, and the black population we had and, and the restrictions that they had. They had to be home by, us, by or I think four or five o'clock at night and they were not allowed to participate in school activities. And they, they had to be sponsored and they were sponsored on a farm. And uh, they were, you know, those are things that I didn't know about. And I, I had never really spent a lot of time and I wished I would have known it uh, about the Spanish uh, elementary school on the on West Side Elementary School, right, West Side West of the Tracks, and and some great students came through that program, and we finally got to integrate them in. I say integrate them in; they got to join us in the junior high and the high school years. But getting to know their backgrounds, we had an opportunity to to get to know them better had we had we got to know them better. They had had them open up. Right. Back then, it was kind of a, you know, live and let live, and and not ask those questions, those those tough questions. Those that's one thing I wished I would have known more about, and that I learned later on, certainly, and certainly in college. This is Kathy <clears throat> Haley interviewing Jack Iverson on April first, two thousand twenty. And we have some additional information we'd like to add to Jack's oral history for the Warski Museum. Jack, over the course of your career, you've had a number of uh, awards and appreciations for what you've achieved. I wonder if you could itemize those and tell us a little bit about what the rewards are and how you felt about receiving them. I sure can, Kathy. Uh, let me start out with uh, time at uh, East High School. And while I was there, we had a, a school that needed updating in the science, de science department, the library. We wanted our own TV studio so we could have an in-house TV system. Um, we needed a whole new uh, in, in industrial ed wing. Uh, and when I was principal, um, the other school across town, we called them the other school, Central High School, um, had a new field house built. And the administrator, the superintendent and his staff came and visited me and said, do you want a field house? I said, no, I don't want a field house. I want science rooms. I want a new library. I want a TV studio. I want a whole new wing for industrial education and for special education. And they came back with this counter proposal. We'll give you everything you want, but Jack, you must accept the school district's secondary program for handicapped children. It's handicapped children were being mainstreamed back into the main, uh, into the high schools during that time period. And, uh, I said, absolutely, we can do it. I said, but on condition that I get to talk to the special ed teachers and they get to tell me the facilities that they want. And I, you know, when they, when we got through negotiating, we ended up with a kitchen so that they could become self-sufficient in preparing their own meals as special education kids. And these kids were not profound, but they were very significantly handicapped. I loved them. They were just lovable kids. They would come up and grab me and, and uh, we would walk down the hall together. And I introduced them at a all school uh, assembly. I said, These are, uh, this is our expanded population. We, if you want to become a friend of any of these, you can come to lunch with them if they invite you to the special ed cafe. 
So teachers and staff and administrators then began to do that. But they gave me what I wanted, which was, which was really good. And what we ended up with was, were those new facilities, a new vocational wing with special education facilities, all new science, state-of-the-art science rooms, uh, a new library, uh, a TV studio that we in-house uh, had our, our announcements of the day were on TV, no longer across the PA system. And then I worked with the Navy Seabees, and that's an engineering group attached to the US Navy to build the parking lot. We had no parking lot attached to that school and kids were beginning to bring their, their, their uh, cars to school and they were parking on the next street over um, across from the, from the uh, school and the neighbors were getting upset with that. So I again sold that to the administration. I said, look, all we're gonna be paying for is the material that they need all of the labor, all of the equipment will be donated by CBs because the CBs need projects to stay current and certified as part of the, the Navy operation. Uh, it was neat to have a guy in our school that was a member of the, the Navy CBs and he kind of walked me through all of that. He was a, uh, a drafting teacher. <clears throat> so that, that was one of the big accomplishments uh, during the first part of my principalship at East High School. Um, I would share with you that I was uh, uh, named as one of the outstanding princ uh, secondary principals in the United States uh, uh, in 1986. And Connie and I were both invited then to Captiva Island to meet with the other 49 uh, designees as outstanding secondary administrators. And we met and talked about education and actually published uh, a, a paper that we all signed off on of how best to proceed with the improvement of public uh, education at the secondary level. And uh, it was just an outstanding time for Connie and I in the middle of the winter to get on an airplane in Denver and fly down to that beautiful area. And we'd never been to Florida before, had no idea what was going to happen. We landed uh, clo close uh, to Fort Myers, but not at Fort Myers. When they bust us to Fort Myers and then across to to Captiva Island and it was just an absolutely fat. I didn't want to come home. I told Connie, I said I could stay down here forever. But it was just a fantastic honor to be able to be representing Wyoming uh, at that conference. Um, the uh, Cheyenne East High School was selected to represent the Wyoming, Wyoming in the secondary school recognition program sponsored by the US Department of Education in 1987 because of our, our academic programs that we had and we we had um, um, advanced placement classes and we had two other programs for advanced kids that we, uh, we just would peel them out because they were totally bored in the classes that they were in and would uh, in most cases uh, uh, be able to identify, especially in science and math and, and writing courses that, that would challenge them. And so we had kids that were completing the uh, the, the curriculum and were actually taking college classes. And when they would graduate from advanced placement classes, they were, had already completed several classes for community college and for the University of Wyoming as well, which was fantastic. And I think of how that could have benefited us in Worland had they had programs like that. It was just, a, it was just so neat to do that. And the other school across town, I say that other school, Central High School, Anytime I would do something, the principal over there would, who had formerly worked at, at East High School in the, uh, in the social studies department would just resent it. He just said, no, I'm not going to do it. Fiverson's doing it. It's not any good. And that was okay. I said, I, I talked to my boss with the assistant superintendent for instruction and the superintendent. And they said, that's okay. If he wants to have a jock school, you can be the academic school. And I said, that's the reason I didn't want a field house. I want to be the academic school for Cheyenne and it will have a football team. You can't live without it. Your, your patrons will not allow you to live without it and a basketball program and a wrestling program and all of those things. And I said, in time, I'll ask for another gymnasium. In time, I'll ask for a, a larger swimming pool. Those are all things that are down the road and a weight room, all of those things that are important for, for building the athletic program. But I said, let's take care of the academics first. And we did. 
you've had success. You ended up superintendent of schools in Cheyenne, the largest city in the state, the state capital on all kinds of uh, statewide and national boards. We've had lots of other students that we grew up with who've had tremendous success in what they decided to do, all the way from Rick Hake being head of maybe 800 rocket scientists to Calvin Lawton, who nearly bought the farm a couple of times doing amazing kinds of firefighting uh, as a pilot. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think was the impact on Worland for us? What what did growing up in Worland in the 1940s and 1950s do to us, do you think? I, I think we were very fortunate, uh, Kathy, to have parents in our community who, uh, who uh, imparted to us uh, a work ethic, a work ethic that, that if you worked hard, if you did what you were told to do, and, and, and we had parents who believed in the teachers that we had in our community. They believed in them. We didn't hear about teachers getting in trouble and teachers being challenged by, by parents. I don't remember that as being part of the environment that we grew up in. The teachers were revered and, and we, we held them in a very high regard. And when we transitioned from elementary to junior, or to, uh, junior high to high school, uh, we knew that those were big transition points and we, we had to, to be ready to, to succeed at that next level. And, uh, and we did. You know, I can't think of failure as being part of our class. We just did not have failure as part of a, uh, as an option for us. Uh, you know, certainly the competitiveness of one to the other in academics and athletics, um, the skills that we were taught gave, provided us uh, uh, success, successful tools for, for writing and, and, for, uh, and successful reading, being, being able to read, uh, read and, and do so critically and not accept everything that was thrown in front of us as being factual. We were taught how to, to be skeptical. But I think most of all from, from Worland and, and, and the school system and the parent community, you know, it was a place you were safe all the time around school. Everybody took care of everybody else's kids. Uh, we had a paper route that we delivered papers around town. And that was really the introduction of us to the rest of the town because we moved to Obisu and we hadn't been around town. We didn't know how you, you, you walked to school, how you got to school and had to kind of rely on Calvin and Kenny Chastain to figure out how to get to school. Um, and- uh, They lived next door. Yes, they did live next door. Yeah, and, and like I shared earlier, they, they were important to us in many ways, including, including uh, Mrs. Margaret Chastain being my dad's teacher for bookkeeping at night school. Adult education classes is what she taught. One of one or one or two classes. I think she taught one in typewriter and one in uh, bookkeeping. <clears throat> but uh, um, and and I can remember going over and play. My parents going over and playing cards at her house with other teachers that she would have. But she would invite my mom and dad to come over and, and play cards. So that was good for for my dad as he uh, adjusted to the to the priorities of education in our in our in our family. Yeah, that's just terrific, Jack. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome, Kathy. And thank you for this visit. I really enjoyed um, you and, and Joanne and, and your, your assisting telling me and in, in organizing my thoughts about the past and the present and the future too.